You ready? Yes, of course. Sweet. Hey guys, welcome back to another video. Today we are joined by Jakob Ingebrigtsen and we're going to be recapping the Copenhagen Marathon. Alright, come join me. I'm obviously joking, I'm not joined here by Jakob Ingebrigtsen. Hopefully one day we can collab, maybe let him know that I exist. But I'm a running coach and I'm going to be breaking down Jakob Ingebrigtsen's training to let you know why he may have blown up. But before we talk about why he blew up in the half marathon, I do want to acknowledge a few other factors because you know, when you analyze a race, it's not gonna be one thing that caused another. Like, it's always gonna be multiple factors, like everything else in running. We don't know what his diet was like leading up to it. We don't know what his sleep was like leading up to it. We do know that he has had a long season in the 1500, running some competitive times, broke the 3K world record, dipped under the 327 barrier for the first time ever. Like, he's achieved some amazing things in the 1500. We know that he's a 1500 runner. We know that he hasn't trained for a half marathon specifically. And two days before the half marathon, he did his final Diamond League race where he won. So obviously that would have played a factor too. And I want to acknowledge that before we break down his training. So this is purely for educational purposes. I'm not saying he should have done this. I know that he's a 1500 runner. Like he shouldn't be training like a half marathoner. There's a lot we can learn from his training. And if you're training for a half marathon, you might learn a thing or two. So that's the point of this video. I don't want people to take it out of context. I'm not trying to tell him how to run a faster half marathon. He probably knows as well. He has huge potential down the line. Trust me, he will be challenging the world record in the half marathon down the line, which is I think 5732 by Jacob keep Lima right now. Another thing I want to say is if he didn't get carried away and try to run with the lead pack, he probably would have run the easiest sub 60 half marathon we've ever seen. He can 100% break 60 minutes if he paces it correctly. We know that through the 10k mark he broke the Norwegian 10k record and also he was on track to run 57.50 or something around there which is one of the fastest half marathon times ever. Breaking the 58 minute barrier is huge in the half marathon and you know people train their whole lives even elite athletes and will never get to sub 58 so he definitely went out ambitious and again I'm gonna say that if he tried to just run 59.50 or something he would have easily done it but you know where's the fun in that right i think he had nothing to lose he has proven that he's you know the best middle distance runner on the planet right now even with his fourth place finish in the olympics yeah i still think he has nothing to prove and he had fun and you know he's just gonna move on so there are two things i want to break down in his training the first thing is regarding his you know threshold training where he has a focus on threshold intervals versus long tempos We'll explain the difference in a second. And the other thing I want to talk about later on in the video is his long run duration. Now we have a fair idea of what Jakob does in a training week. Obviously, this is probably more his base building phase. And during the season, he will do more speed work. Now we know that Jakob is known for doing double threshold days where he does Tuesday and Thursday double thresholds where he does LT1 reps in the morning and LT2 reps in the afternoon. LT1 reps will be something like, you know, K repeats, six minute repeats and then in the afternoons he'll typically do like 400 meter repeats or two minute repeats and stuff like that now obviously those are just a few examples he cycles through a lot of different workouts i'm assuming but because of this we know that he gets a lot of his aerobic volume from those double threshold days he runs like 180 to 190k weeks but he gets a lot of his mileage from the Tuesday and Thursday double threshold days to the point where his weekly long run is not actually that long. He does like 20k long runs. And I remember talking to Matt Hanzo recently about how he said he's heard rumors about him only doing like 70 minute long runs nowadays, which is very short. And again, we'll talk more about that later. I'm pretty sure Jakob Ingebrigtsen does pretty short long runs as well. I don't think he goes too far. Yeah, yeah. I've heard recently he barely goes over like 70 minutes. And this is where we can learn a few things from his training to work out why he blew up in the half marathon. Again, a huge factor is that he went out too quick, but there's a few other factors that we can actually look into as well. So the first out of the two points I'm gonna address is the difference between long tempos and threshold intervals. Now in the past, people have done a lot of like 30 minute tempos and all that sort of like long continuous tempo efforts. And the recent model of training kind of looks more at threshold intervals, but in reality, they're actually both important. So as a 1500 guy, I think there is a lot of benefit for Jakob Ingebrigtsen to do those threshold intervals. This graph shows a great example of everything I'm gonna talk about. You can see that in the threshold zone, you spend a lot more time in it in threshold intervals because, because your lactate levels are gonna go up in the first rep of the interval. But then before you cross the threshold barrier, 
you're gonna have a rest period where the lactate levels go down a bit, but not too low to the point that you're still sitting at that threshold zone. And in the next rep, you're gonna creep that lactate up again until you almost hit that threshold. And then again, you have another rest period to let it come down. And the cumulative effect of doing multiple threshold intervals is that you spend actually more time in threshold than when you do a long tempo sometimes. And the other benefit is that because we're doing intervals and we have a rest period, we can actually afford to go a bit quicker because we're gonna have that rest period to let the lactate levels go down. And we know that there's a lot to be gained from doing a lot of volume at threshold. Threshold isn't too much about pace, it's more about the amount of time we spend doing threshold. It's the highest level of aerobic activity that we can perform at. And that's why threshold intervals have become so popular nowadays. But what Matt Hanzo talks about in the collab that we did recently is that he He's training for, you know, cross country, 8K, 10K, that sort of thing. And he reckons in the previous season, he did too much threshold intervals, not enough continuous tempos. And he feels like he wasn't as strong endurance wise. And when we talk about strength in, in running, a lot of the time we're talking about enduring strength, as in how strong we are in the back end of the run to like maintain or even just run a fast pace for a long period of time. So talking about continuous tempos now, we know that when you do a continuous tempo, you don't have that interval rest to let the lactate levels go down. So it's constantly going up. So if you don't pace yourself properly in a 30 minute tempo, you're probably gonna go above threshold like 15 minutes into the rep. So it takes a lot of discipline to run the right level. So it's gonna be a lot slower than your threshold interval reps, which is why threshold pace is not a thing. Threshold is looking at your blood lactate level. That's the most important thing to know. If anyone says threshold is your one hour pace and all that sort of stuff, yes, that is a guideline, but that's not like the scientific background of what threshold is. So Matt Hanzo did like an 8K continuous tempo at like 316 per K. When he does his threshold intervals, he's gonna be running way quicker than 316 per K. But he was smart enough to know that continuous tempo just requires a bit of patience and running the right level. And it's gonna be a bit slower, but you're running for longer with no rest. Doing that a lot as well will teach you how to run by feel at threshold for a long time and that goes a long way into helping with like half marathon performance and as you get to the longer distance races. How often would you do like a session like this where you're doing a long tempo? Oh yeah, so I usually do like threshold like intervals, but um, I guess especially because I'm transitioning to more like the cross country season in the States, it's an 8K, 10K cross country race. I think there's a bit more need for continuous tempos at times. I'll probably hit one like once every three or four weeks, once a month per se. The lactate's gonna accumulate over the session in comparison to doing intervals and you won't be able to run as fast but obviously when I'm racing for 24 to 30 minutes um, yeah it's probably a little bit more need to actually practice continuous running what I found in my last block is I probably didn't do enough of it when I ran a 10k I'm um, at Launceston I ran 30 10 which is a great run but I've run 14 10 I probably should have been able to run on the 30 and I think a lot of that was I just never practiced running anything longer than like a 2k or a 3k rep so definitely something for the cross season I'm going to try and implement a bit more is there still using kind of like a sub T like Mark Smith of NAU do, does it a lot um, at Buffalo Park they do like you know seven eight mile or like 11 to 13k sub thresholds and that's kind of what we're doing this morning. As a 1500 guy Jakob doesn't have much to worry about that sort of continuous tempo which is why he does all these threshold intervals four times a week and he does no continuous tempos. So again I'm not saying Jakob should have done continuous tempos but if he did I think he would have been able to hold that really fast you know 57 50 half marathon pace for longer like more than 10k at least. And the next thing we're going to talk about is his long run duration. Now we know that Matt Hanzo recently heard from somewhere that he does like 70 minute long runs nowadays, which is very short when you consider people training for a half marathon. Now when you're training for a half marathon or a marathon, I think there is a lot of benefit to having one long run a week and that long run being a fair amount longer than the duration that you're going to run the half marathon for. Now this obviously depends on the level of running and several other factors like your training history, training age, what race experience you have and all that sort of stuff. But speaking from me as an example, if I'm roughly a 70 minute half marathoner, I wouldn't want to be doing 70 minute long runs. I'd want to be running way longer than that to get my body used to being in an aerobic state for longer than 70 minutes. I actually try and do like a minimum of two hours every single Sunday and if anything I like even going up to three hours because just being able to run so much longer than your race duration gives you so much confidence when you're going into the race and it helps to be able to run for that long because we know that this fasted state fat adaptation run thing doesn't actually work because we heard from a proper sports nutritionist recently that came on my channel and going two hours into a long run is going to allow you to deplete that glycogen storage a bit more and make you 
use fat as a fuel source a bit more. So there's a lot of benefits to be gained from doing longer runs and doing a 70 minute long run isn't gonna get you that far, especially when you wanna run a really good half marathon. Again, Jakob is an exception. He could have run 59 minutes without all this stuff that I'm talking about, but it's just he was trying to go for the world record and that requires proper specific training, which is where I'm getting at. The other thing with long runs is you need to be able to experiment with long runs with workouts in the second half and also long runs with just easy mileage the whole way. The easy long runs are gonna allow you to have more time on feet. You're gonna spend a lot more time in the aerobic state. But if you do a long run workout, you're gonna be running quicker. So the duration might be a bit shorter, but then you get that benefit of running at half marathon pace or faster in the second half of a long run in a more fatigued state, which actually gives you confidence as well. So I like to rotate between different types of long runs. I sometimes, and this is like rare, I sometimes do very long tempos as in like 30k tempos and stuff but that is quite taxing on the body so i wouldn't recommend that to everyone and if you do do it i would only do it like once or maximum twice in a training block but again that's very individual and it depends on a few things so i hope this video is helpful again i really don't want people to come at me in the comments i made it clear i'm not saying jacob should have done this to run a better half marathon he is a 1500 runner he has nothing to prove in the half marathon right now as he's a 1500 runner in his prime he's the best 1500 runner in the world but if he wanted to run a 57 50 half marathon i'm just saying these are the stuff that I would have changed in his training and I hope that you can learn from that. So once again, thank you for watching another video. I love talking about running training. I'm a coach and this is the sort of stuff I think about when I am training athletes. It's so individual. It depends what you're training. It depends on so many factors and that's the beauty of getting a coach. I do have a wait list for my coaching services now and if you're interested, I'll leave a link in the description below to join that wait list and yeah, apart from that, thanks for watching and more videos coming soon.